Alrighty, well, good afternoon and welcome everybody. Thank you for joining us today. My name is Andrew Daphne and with us today is Cindy Warwick, who's in charge of our, our author talk series, as well as Sandra Turner Barnes, um, who will be giving her presentation today. Um, just a few housekeeping items before I turn it over to Cindy for the proper introduction. Um, we will be taking questions at the end of the program today, so please use the question box in the GoToWebinar dashboard and submit your questions, and then we'll be happy to answer them at the end of the program today. Um, and just a quick tutorial for those of you who may be unfamiliar with GoToWebinar. Um, this is what your dashboard should look like if you're using a desktop or a laptop, um, depending if you're using an Android or uh, Apple device, the, the mobile device, the interface is going to look different, but all of the features are still there. Um, if you have any problems, use this raise hand button here, and that'll alert me that there's some type of issue and I will get in contact with you and hopefully we'll be able to resolve them. Um, if you're having issues with the audio and you're not hearing anything, um, you might, or if it cuts out or something, um, this is the audio tab where you should be able to pick um, which audio device you're looking at and make sure that if you're using your device or computer that it's connected to computer audio. Um, there are no handouts for today, so you don't need to worry about that. And lastly, there is this questions box here where you can type in your question, hit send, um, and then that will get sent to us and we'd be happy to answer them for you. And that is everything that I have for you, so I'm going to turn it over to Cindy for the introduction. All right. Well, thank you for joining us today, everyone. We are so happy to have you with us and to be able to commemorate Black History Month. And this is great because we're starting off. It's only February 3rd. Um, and so then we can take it through the month. And I hope everybody is doing well and staying safe. Didn't have to shovel too much snow. There are two webinars that are coming up for Black History Month. Now, these are not the only webinars that we have, but since I'm high, we're highlighting this, I wanted to let you know that on February 16th, we have Hidden Figures Revealed, African-American Notables in a Union County Town, Summit, New Jersey. And then on February 24th is Finding Benjamin James and the History of the Mount Eli Hancock House. So, uh, you know, go to our website uh, at www.njstatelib dot org and choose events and you will see the different events there that you uh, can sign up for free and register. The re registration is required. <laughs> Our next talk here with the author talk series is going to be one to kind of kick off Women's History Month and it is exactly a month from today. It's on March 3rd. We're going to be having Meryl Carmel and she's going to be talking about Kate Macy Ladd, and the title of the book is Finding Kate, The Unlikely Journey of 20th Century Healthcare Advocate, Kate Macy Ladd. If memory serves me correctly, it took her about 10 years to write this book. She got interested in Kate Macy Ladd and just started to take this unlikely journey, so to speak, and then um, a book came out of it. So um, that will be the healthcare advocate, Kate Macy Ladd, and that's for Women's History Month. For now, I wanna to go to our presenter and she has many, many accolades to her name and um, because of who she is and, and what she does. Our presenter is a poet, she's Sandra Turner Barnes and she holds a degree in business administration from Pierce College of Philadelphia. Uh, Philadelphia, yes, I do know how to say that. I've lived here all my life. And traces her ancestry in Southern New Jersey to 1787 and both the Sadler and the Still families. She is the former executive director of the Camden County Cultural and Heritage Commission and former president for Camden City Charter School, a, a thing called City Invincible. She's a founding board member of the New Jersey State Black Cultural and Heritage Initiative and currently serves as a board member of the Camden County Historical Society, the Benson Multicultural Museum, and the Institute for the Development of Education in the Arts. She's also served on the adjunct faculty for Camden County College and Rutgers University Camden's Roberto Clemente Humanities course. She is a busy lady. She's also a recognized person. In 2018, Ms. Turner Barnes was named the 2018 Astute Woman Advocate of the Year by the National Association of University Women of Southern New Jersey and received the 2018 City of Camden Legacy Award. In 2017, Sandra participated in New Jersey's first ancestral remembrance ceremony, unveiling the first historical marker related to the transatlantic slave trade. She's also received awards for her children's book, 
Beyond the Back of the Bus, which is a tribute to Rosa Parks and the civil rights movement. For her poetry and her short stories, she appears in countless anthologies and her book of poetry, but mostly love, was nominated for the 2011 National Book Award. She currently hosts mm -hmm. the popular literary and poetry series, A Place in Time at Camden's Pomona Hall, which was built in 1718 as the former 400 acre apple plantation. Yes, I said plantation in Camden, owned by the Cooper family, which held a minimum of 14 enslaved Africans throughout time. And now I turn it over to our presenter, Sandra Turner Barnes. Thank you for being with us, Sandra, and we're looking forward to what you're going to tell us about little known truths regarding African enslavement in New Jersey from 1695 to 1866. Thank you, thank Cindy you. and Andrew. Thank you very much for the invitation to be here today and for that introduction. I love history. I have always loved history. I could get A's in history when I couldn't get anything else because I'm a curious kind of person. That runs through my family actually because we are a, a bunch of curious and, and wonderful people that I love being around. I'd like to begin the presentation today by inviting the audience to imagine New Jersey back in 1695. Or if you want to jump a little further into the 17 or 1800s, you can do that too. Imagine what this beautiful green state must have looked like. Then imagine being hungry. Oh no, you, you, you can't jump in the car and run out to the supermarket or, or to the restaurant. You need to work hard. You need to find a lake to get some water. You need to find a, a bird or an animal that you can shoot and kill and begin preparing it in order to eat hours, hours later. Imagine cold nights and hot evenings, no air conditioning, no heat, none of that. Imagine what life was like in those early years. And then open your eyes and realize that you are an enslaved African charged with doing all the work to make life more comfortable for others, and certainly not for yourself. Imagine missing your own homeland and, and your family that you were taken away from. And then take this journey with me now. And just so that you'll know that I didn't make this stuff up, I want to acknowledge that the research contained within this talk regarding enslaved Africans in the state of New Jersey was gathered from, first of all, the New Jersey State Library database as well as the transatlantic slave trade database. Now that database consists of the combined research of great scholars from Emory University as here in the United States, as well as from other locations throughout the world. the great deal of information from the University of Hull, H-U-L-L, of the United King Kingdom, and the Universidad Federal of Rio de Janeiro in Brazil. As part of Wikipedia, that massive online encyclopedia, History of Slavery Database, and the section of study of slavery in New Jersey by John Hopkins Press 
written back in 1896. And another one I'd, I'd like to share comes from a text, a book called In Motion, and that's the African American Migration Experience. Uh, from the Schomburg Center for Research in Black Culture. And that was authored by Howard Dobson and Sylvian Dion. And finally, as a proud member of the Board of Directors of the Camden County Historical Society, located in the city of Camden, I'm pleased to acknowledge the vast reference resources available there regarding slavery within Camden County and Southern New Jersey. I'd like to acknowledge the initial work of one of Camden County's finest artists and, and cultural practitioners. That was Beverly Collins Roberts, who in 2005, first discovered and revealed the history of enslaved Africans who once resided in the attic at Camden's Pomona Hall. And I, I'm just uh, excited to know that that building directly across the street from Hatch Middle School, and there may be many of you here that lived in the city of Camden or visited the city of Camden and walked down Park Boulevard wondering, wonder what that building is. That's Pomona Hall, a wonderful building that hosts and houses the Camden County Historical Society, and I'm proud to say in which I host a monthly poetry series entitled A Place in Time. And we'll tell you a little bit more about Pomona Hall as we go through the program. And while we can document the arrival of literally millions of Africans to these shores of the United States, including the state of New Jersey, in both Perth Amboy and the city of Camden and other areas, there's very little evidence of the existence, the actual existence or the death and burial of enslaved Africans. And, and we'd be lucky to, to find records of a few hundred former enslaved Africans here within the state of New Jersey. Slavery in New Jersey began as early as 1625. The Dutch West Indian Company introduced slavery to the land area once known as the New Netherland. And the first Dutch colony in North America with the importation of 11 enslaved Africans which worked as farmers and fur traders and builders. And a large area of land south of New Netherland, which is New York City, became known as New Jersey in 1625. And then slavery expanded across the North River, the Hudson River, to small towns which eventually became Bergen County, where enslaved Africans worked the company plantation. Now, new settlers to the area began holding slaves privately, often using them as domestic servants and laborers. And although enslaved, the Dutch once offered these Africans a few basic rights, and their families were usually kept intact. Early Dutch-owned slaves could testify in court, sign legal documents, and bring civil actions 
against whites. Some were even permitted to work after hours and to earn wages equal to those paid to white workers. When that Dutch colony fell, however, the Dutch West Indian Company freed all its slaves, estab establishing early on a nucleus of free Negroes within the state of New Jersey. And according to our dear Dr. Clement Price, even after their English successors took over the land and renamed the area New Jersey, promoting slavery was hardwired into the state's political economy. And according to the New Jersey State Library's unit on African-American slavery in the colonial area, the colony's first constitution called the Concessions and Agreement of 1654 to 1665. And this constitution actually provided additional acreage or what's known as head rights for each slave a prospective settler had. And by the end of the 17th century, Jersey-bound settlers were promised anywhere from between 60 to 75 acres for each slave they had on hand. Other documents indicate as much as a 150-acre incentive per slave. In 1664, the largest known chattel of African slaves were owned by Colonel Lewis Morris of Shrewsbury, Monmouth County. Now, Morris's holdings in Monmouth County included an ironworks structured as a plantation, and 60 to 70 enslaved Africans were held in bondage there in 1680. Slavery really got traction in the northern and eastern portions of New Jersey. The major port of entry for slave trafficking was through Perth Amboy. In northern New Jersey from 1737 up until 1800, the slave population went from just under 4,000 to well over 12,000. And Bergen County quickly developed as the largest slave holding county in the state, in part because many slaves were used as laborers in its ports and cities. Now let's talk about the city of Camden again. The city of Camden was also a major port for the importation of slaves. Its ferry docks on the Delaware River directly across from Philadelphia acting as auction sites for many of the plantations throughout the Delaware Valley, which included Pomona Hall, owned by the Cooper family, and the Hug Harrison Plantation of Belmar, which was recently torn down to, to expand to 95 but there had to be some great history there that we would have loved to have gotten our hands on. <laughs> okay, so records dating back to December 20th, 1706, taken from the will of John Hug of the Harrison Hug House of Belmore, declare as part of John Hug's personal property, seven Negro girls for a total of nine Negroes. 
1727, the September 14 and October 5th edition of the American Weekly Mercury, a newspaper advertisement read as follows. To be sold by John Connor, a parcel of young Negro men, boys and girls at reasonable rates are to be seen at William Cooper's in the Jersey and at Joseph Hugs at Gloucester. Now, this represents the earliest slave sales at the ferries in southern New Jersey at Camden. Earlier sales may have occurred, but no documentary records of such appear to exist. Nor is there any other information regarding John Hood's nine Negroes. Now, the Cooper Ferry Service for moving people across the Delaware River between New Jersey and, and Philadelphia, beginning in the late 17th century, are the roots from which the city of Camden grew. The first ferry established between Philadelphia and New Jersey operated from the foot of present day Cooper Street to Arch Street in Philadelphia. Daniel Cooper began ferry operations at this location in 1695. Now, Philadelphians knew this service as the old ferry, indicating its antiquity, which means that there had to be a ferry there operating before and after. Now, Daniel Cooper maintained the ferry until his death in 1715. And it's unclear who provided the service following Daniel's death, but in 1727, his son William had become the owner operator. Now, while the auctions held at three different ferries in Camden City appear to be excessive, these sales likely introduced upwards to thousands of new slaves to West New Jersey and Eastern Pennsylvania. The regular movement of slave vessels up the Delaware River began in 1695 and ships arrived at docks along the Philadelphia side as well as Camden. Now over 1300 enslaved Africans were reportedly disembarked from Guinea ships, a portion of an advertisement that first appeared in the August 9th, 1764 issue of the Pennsylvania Journal. And it read, to be sold by Garrett and George Meade at Roberts Ferry opposite the city, a parcel of stout, likely young Gold Coast slaves. The notice stated that the Negroes from this country are esteemed better than from any other part of the coast. And those Gold Coast slaves will be sold on very reasonable terms for cash or short credit. Hmm. Cash or short credit. Now we're going to talk about Pomona Hall again. Pomona Hall, and, and we're going to uh, hopefully show a PowerPoint presentation as well. Uh, Andrew, are you able to assist me with that? 
Thank you. Thank you. What I'd like for, for you to notice, do you see this historical marker on the left? I am so proud to say that there are three of those currently in the city of Camden at the actual locations where the slave blocks were. And these are New Jersey state uh, historical markers. And I, I was there for the installation of all three of them. And I, I'm so proud of the work being done at the Camden County Historical Society. Uh, so the first one was at Front and Cooper. But what even I didn't know at the time, at that location stood another great house owned by the Coopers. What stands there now is the Walt Whitman Art Center. I was a director of development at the Walt Whitman Arts Center <laughs> for many years and the marble steps leading up to the second and third floor uh, always seemed to, to have blood on the steps. And I was constantly calling Rutgers saying, would you please come send someone over to take care of the steps? when I found out that that was the actual slave marker, I, I was amazed. I, that was the actual block. And I, I still need to look further into that. So the first is that front and Cooper. And I'm very grateful that the Coopers maintain such great records and didn't throw it all out. Okay, now this, the second page of this PowerPoint presentation, because I can't seem to move it. Ha, huh. now this is Pomona Hall. Take a look at this building. The current building was constructed in two parts, in 1726 and in 1788. Now it was in the middle of a 400 acre plantation, apple plantation. And that would take up the entire Parkside neighborhood. The building was named after Pomona, the Roman goddess of fruit trees. And every once in a while, when we walk inside those doors, I kind of think there's somebody else with us too. <laughs> it's a great place. It, it's like the kitchen, the bedrooms, the living rooms, the dining room. Look just as they did back in the 1700s. So we're closed now due to the epidemic, but when it opens again, please do come visit. Okay, on page three. Again, we did talk about three generations of Coopers. And I must say here that the Coopers were Quakers. And that's a wonderful thing for New Jersey and for former enslaved Africans because Quakers knew and loved the Lord and acted accordingly. So uh, they eventually freed their slaves. Well, most of them. Quakers did, and uh, treated people more decently than uh, others, especially those in the South. 
and each Cooper family that lived in Pomona Hall enslaved people and also purchased indentured servants to work on the plantation. Now, as of 2021, as of today, documents show that there were at least 19 people who were enslaved by the Coopers. 19 enslaved and 19 that lived at Pomona Hall. Thank you. Next page. Now we're going to give you the names. I think someone asked me the question if this information was available. I think it was Ronald. Uh, yes. This is the information for Camden County. So those African Africans enslaved by the Cooper family include Bethina, Dina, James, and they were enslaved by Joseph Jr. Elizabeth was enslaved Isaac. No, Elizabeth was enslaved by Isaac Cooper. Cuff, Grace, Greg, Luke, Mark, Peter, and Sam were enslaved by Isaac and then willed, left by Isaac in his will to Marmaduke. Dick, Hector, James, Prince, Rose, and Susanna Farmer, and Violet were also enslaved by Marmaduke. And records show that Thomas was the last person enslaved by Marmaduke, and that he, along with the others, were freed on December 17, 1792. Now here you see the actual signature of Marmaduke Cooper. And his signature is from a 1770 document mentioning the enslavement of a woman named only as Rose. And Marmaduke was kicked out of his local friends association in 1780 because of his refusal to free the people he enslaved. And he manumuted all of his people in 1792. And I believe Marmaduke died in 1797. Thank you. Okay, next page. Now when we talk about the ceremonies involving the installation of the historical markers, starting in 2015. Now you must remember I mentioned earlier that Beverly had found out the information in 2005. So we had that information and a lot of work went into notifying the states, trying to get money, trying to get everything done, get the awareness out there so that these markers could come apart. And I, I again will say I am so proud to be working with this amazing group of individuals. Our, our president is Chris Pertz. Uh, Derek Davis is the chairman of the African American uh, projects that we do. Uh, I am on that committee and several others, it has 
been such a blessing to work with the Middle Passages ceremonies and Port Markers people, and then to have the funding for the markers provided by New Jersey State and TD Bank Project Grants. The three auction sites identified in the city of Camden were Front and Cooper, up front and federal, that's right across from the PSE and G building there. And the first one on Cooper Street is right across from the Camden City Board of Education. And the last marker, which we installed this past September in a wonderful ceremony, um, is on the shoreline where the riverfront prison used to be, but, but has been torn down. That, that was remarkable to me because I consider imprisonment in many ways uh, a near cousin to slavery. Uh, so it, you have no idea what a blessing it is to be involved with this project. So I'm very grateful. Thank you. Next page, please, Andrew. And this, this talks about the initial marker style that included maps and images and documents and a longer history of the auction sites. Uh, but you get a great group of people together and we debated and came up with what we currently have now. Came up with the proper language and we elevated these signs up to eight feet tall in hopes that everyone will be able to see them. Next, please. Thank you. This is the actual marker, a closer image of it for you to see. Um, and in a bolder language that you can read as well. And actually, I, I'd like to acknowledge that we've had refrigerator markers made out of these so that are available to purchase or upon visiting when that's available again, that you can have one of these to sit on your refrigerator or your file cabinet or whatever be to because it's a magnet so that you could have that information near and dear to you. And I will say now, as I say to many people, in the city of Camden, there's not one step you can take. There's nowhere that you can walk, that you're not walking in the path of African ancestors. The shame in this situation is not ours, but it is so important to share the information so that people will know and understand what has been happening all these years and make some changes, some changes in attitude. The work that was done to build this country all came from African ancestors. And they weren't just physical strength. These were brilliant minds who designed and erected the buildings, even the White House in Washington, D.C. Who prepared the food, made the clothing, designed the furniture? All of the things that make this country great, African African Americans were involved in that. And it's my opinion, but it's also the truth. If you look back at history, 
you will find that. Thank you. Next page, I think. Ha, huh. okay. This was the second marker. This was when we had Stedman Graham was one of our, our speakers on that day. He was our keynote speaker. But this is the marker that stands directly across from the uh, PSE&G company there, uh, pictured here from left to right. You see Sandra Houghton. She is the director of uh, Freedom Theater in the city of Philadelphia and also a board member of the Camden County Historical Society. Standing next to her is the chief. This is uh, Chief Methuselah, who is the chief of Sierra Leone in Africa. I believe I have that right. Standing next to him is myself and Carmen Rodriguez, directly behind Carmen is Derek Davis and next to him is, is Robert, our board member. And I don't know the name of the gentleman standing behind me. But all of these ceremonies were wonderful. Uh, people poured their heart and soul into expressing our gratitude because had it not been for enslaved Africans, none of us would be here. And that being said, in order to um, prepare for some questions that I'm sure you have that I'm hoping I can answer for you. I'd like to just end here and now with just a, a tribute to the enslaved Africans that walked this land all over this country, but also in the city of Camden and in South Jersey in Philadelphia, everywhere. There's so many of us. Your daily existence had to be horrible, but with God's grace, you somehow survived. And because you lived and learned and loved, today, we are alive. Lord knows your path was full of danger and death and evil lingered near. And at times you must have been afraid, but for your courage, we are here. And because you boldly took a stand in hopes of someday being free, your seed still grows proud and strong for we are your family. And we shall proudly tell our children of the great sacrifice you made and how this family's heritage began with brave souls once called slaves. For your spirit lives on within us. Through us, may your every dream come true. For we are those seeds of love sown so long ago by you. For we are those seeds of courage sown so long ago by you. We are those seeds of hope sown so long ago by you. We are those seeds of freedom sown so long ago by you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Okay, if you have questions, send them at me, please.
<laughs> All right, thank you, Sandra. Yes, if anybody does have questions, please feel free to submit them to us using the questions box. Um, or if you want to raise your hand, maybe I can get in touch with you and we can field your questions that way. But fantastic presentation, I'm sure we have some good ones coming in. So um, first, it was actually going back to uh, Marmaduke Cooper, uh, somebody just wanted to make a comment that um, he was a holdout in freeing his slaves after it was determined at the yearly meeting that it was improper to hold human beings as property. And this was 60 years before the Emancipation Proclamation. And you, are, you are so right. Uh, he did. He said several times, well, I'm going to free them, but he never did. What, what he did instead was just not pay the taxes because you you were required to pay taxes on your slaves and uh i i don't know maybe he just got attached <laughs> or maybe you know he definitely needed the work to continue but i, I am sure it was it was quite a circumstance yeah Is there another yes um it's on the page right now, but somebody asked, are there other middle passages markers in New Jersey? And they, they are up on the screen right now. Uh, Looks like. Well, I can't see it, but if you could close the PowerPoint, maybe it'll come up. Uh, no, right. I'm, they're on your PowerPoint right now. It says oh. each marker was unveiled. Yes, they were each unveiled. Yeah. So uh, the first one, November of 2017, Senator Cory Booker came to town and did that one with us, and it was it was a wonderful. Um, it's actually on YouTube. You you can find that that presentation. Okay, but I'm happy to say, thanks to Derek Davis and and. Uh, others involved in the project we are going to put up a fourth marker and that's going to be in perth amboy and i believe i mentioned during the presentation that perth amboy was a major uh port for bringing slaves into the state of new jersey all right uh, Yep. Was Camden involved in the Underground Railroad? Yes, absolutely. Right under the nose of bringing them in, not far from there was Macedonia uh, Baptist Church. It's not far from there at all. It, it, there were people escaping. The, there's a, a tunnel underneath the church. Uh, and there were other locations uh, throughout South Jersey. And that's a whole nother session about the, uh, the Underground Railroad in New Jersey that, that I hope I get a chance to present. But yes, Lawnside, uh, parts of Haddonfield, uh, here in Lawnside, I live in Lawnside, there, there was a Peter Mott house. But if you saw a church with a red door, that's where you could find help. Any other questions? Yes, uh, is there a walking tour of the sites? No, but there should be. <laughs> uh, we can certainly let you know through the Camden County Historical uh, Society exactly where they are so that you can get there and see it uh, um, take pictures with it but we don't have one going on at this time great question though thank you all right um where can i get the magnet at the camden county historical society uh you can call 856-964-3333 and ask to have some of the refrigerator magnets or, or office magnets sent to you. 
will be happy to oblige. Um, are you going to do the poem Camden Slave Block? <laughs> Today? <laughs> well, uh, absolutely, if someone would would like to hear that. Um, I did want to make one more notation that is, is so critical to this entire picture about slavery within the state of New Jersey. During the, the, the Civil War, when uh, the states were voting to side with the South, North Jersey wanted to side with the South. They wanted to keep their slaves, but Southern New Jersey outvoted them, so that didn't happen. But what did happen, there was a separate proclamation issued by the New Jersey state legislators that allowed them to keep their slaves just a little longer, even after uh, the Emancipation Proclamation. Um, so slaves in New Jersey were not officially freed until uh, January of 1886. And I think you saw that back on the PowerPoint presentation. And, and one more thing we should share is that while racism and differential treatment still exists throughout New Jersey, in 2008, the New Jersey State Legislature acknowledged the state's role in the history of slavery within the state of New Jersey and within the United States of America and issued this statement. The legislature of the state of New Jersey expresses its profound regret for the state's role in slavery and apologizes for the wrongs inflicted by slavery and its after effects in the United States of America. We express our deepest sympathies and solemn regrets to those who were enslaved and the descendants of those slaves who were deprived of life, human dignity, and the constitutional protections accorded all citizens of the United States. And we encourage all citizens to remember and teach their children about the history of slavery, Jim Crow laws, and modern day slavery as well to ensure that these tragedies will neither be forgotten nor repeated. All right. Uh, Cooper family, the Cooper okay. family had a huge history in Camden, um, yet as slave owners, should their name grace the hospital? <sighs> The thing about slavery, and in this case, it's important to remember that while the Coopers were Quakers and involved in slavery, everyone was involved in slavery. If you had a dime, you had a slave. It, 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 it's cruel to say it that way. So it was the lay of the land. But at the same time that wrongs were being done, good was always also being done. I think that the most important thing that we can do now 
about slavery, about the wrongs that were done in this country. Tell the truth. Own up to it. Apologize. And let's move on. Because it's, it's taking so much time, so much pain to debate and argue over. You can't change it. It can't be changed. I would be the first one to want to roll back history and change the things that went on. They were building Cooper Hospital at the same time they were trying to get out of being a part of slavery. I said it. That's what I believe. I hope no one is offended by that. I don't know what good anybody thinks it would do to to change history, because that's what would, would have to happen. Is there another question? There are plenty of questions. Um, <laughs> okay. A, a clarification for the, the, the markers questions. Um, they said that those are in Camden. Are there any else throughout the state of New Jersey? As I said, the next one that we are aware of is going to be in Perth Amboy. I know that directly across the water in the city of Philadelphia, there's another one. But as far as I know, it's just these three markers, just within the last three years. So uh, it's going to take some time, but there needs to be one everywhere. I don't have a date for when Per Fanboy will happen, but I will check with Mr. Derek Davis and uh, the other members of the New Jersey Black Culture and Heritage Initiative and see when that's going to happen and make it public so that everybody can attend. It is a feeling you cannot imagine. Yeah. Um, do you know if slaves were used in the early New Jersey glassmaking industry? I, I, I don't know, but I, I don't know. I, I would imagine so. They were very smart people. All right. Yeah. Um, Another question? What, yes. What was the name or author of the poem stated at the end of the program? I only do my poetry. I'm sorry. And I am the author. The name of the poem is called Seeds of Greatness and Love. And the author is Sandra Turner Barnes. Thank you so much, Sandra. What might you know of New Jersey's Underground Railroad connections, especially the route via Philadelphia Cannon across New Jersey? Um, I understand there were several overland routes, one leading from Camden to Burlington and on to Bordentown, Princeton, and New Brunswick. That is a great question. And what I'd like to share, I don't know if you can see this, but this is a booklet provided by the New Jersey Histor Historical Commission. Their telephone number is 609-292-6062. This wonderful little booklet on the Underground Railroad. Please call them and ask for these. I think there are some available at the Camden County Historical Society as well. But your Historical Commission in Trenton, New Jersey has some great information as well. All right. Uh, as a Camden native, I so appreciate the wealth of knowledge about this city's history and your dedication to educating us about our history. Wonderful presentation. Thank you. Another one, fabulous talk, thank you. But my question is, who were the people who transported enslaved people to Camden? What company or nationalities? 
Wow. Um, in the beginning, uh, this was Europe's idea, and as well as the Spain and the Philippines. They they began not the Philippines, um, but it out of Europe. Ships went straight to Africa in terms of buying people to resell them. And England has acknowledged their role in slavery as well. And England was the first to end slavery. That history is available as well. Uh, somebody says the man behind Sandra was Stedman himself. Ah. <laughs> okay. I I I don't agree. <laughs> Who said that? Who said that? Were, were they there that day? I I don't know. <laughs> that was just the, I'm sorry. Stedman uh, Stedman is taller than that. He almost has to bend completely over to <laughs> to, to shake your hand to talk to you. He's he's a very tall man. So um these next three are kind of all related. Um, they all kind of want you or want to know if you will do a session on the Underground Railroad in, in New Jersey. I would. I, 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 yes, I would do that. All right. I, I'm, I'm learning more about it every day. I'm excited about the great history because of my ancestors. You know, Joshua Sadler, William Still, I, I am, yes, that will happen. And this year, 2021, is the 200th birthday of William Still. So it is something I am preparing and that I would very much like to do. All right. Um, Muriel Roberts, who, who you know, just wants to say thank you for an enlightening presentation and please keep her informed regarding the Perth Amboy event. Absolutely. Um, where could one find the New Jersey Proclamation? Ooh. Um, regarding their apology for slavery or, or because there's a lot of proclamations. The one that I've read at the end? Yes, I believe. Okay. I I think you could just Google that and it would pop up. If if not, um, please do um, call the Camden County Historical Society and we will make every effort to get that to you. All right, and we certainly, if you want to contact the New Jersey State Library too, we, we can get you those proclamations as well. Great, great. Um, this is uh, just an FYI. Um, there is a Lost Souls project, project in the New Brunswick area at work on acknowledging the auctioning of slaves there. Um, there is also a coalition working with the EJI to post a marker in the Eatontown area to acknowledge the only known lynching in New Jersey. Yes, well, I'd like to know more of that. So um, I think my email address uh, as well as my website are available. And if someone could keep me up on that or just make sure the information reaches the uh, Camden County Historical Society, we we may want to be involved in that. All right. Um. Uh, more people are saying thank you so much for putting this together. This was an interest, very interesting and important. Um, they appreciate it. How many people attended? Uh, it looks like at our peak we had I think 80 or 82. So definitely. Um, 
This is wonderful. Okay. Thank you to the New Jersey State Library and to you, Sandra. Um, I'm already looking forward to the Underground Railroad talk. <laughs> <laughs> well, thank you. Thank you. I, uh, um, yeah. I, I, I love being a part of this. And uh, it's, it's a blessing to my soul. And I hope it's a blessing to the souls of others. Yes. Honor your ancestors. Send them a smile. They'll appreciate it. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, did slaves who were emancipated in Camden tend to stay in the area? <sighs> that, there is some proof of that because they kind of migrated to this area anyhow from all over the place. Now, I, I've just written a poetic history on the town of Lawnside, and it amazes me that how people found their way to this little town. There was no GPS, there was you no know, maps, there was, you know, people found their way here. So, uh, People know where they'll be safe and where they'll be welcomed. So, and New Jersey was that, you know, again, because Quakers in South Jersey were the ones that owned slaves and freed slaves. It was a Quaker that bought the land in Lawnside, New Jersey, and broke it up into lots of lands and made that land available to escape slaves or to mixed breed African Americans. So, you know, it's a lot of good that came out of that evil. So yeah, I kind of think once you got to Jersey, you might have stayed here, especially if you came from down south. All right. Um, just let everybody know the Apology for Slavery link has been posted in the chat, and I am also going to be posting right now the uh, Steal Away, Steal Away that we have digitally through the New Jersey State Library. So give me one moment. Oh, this and is. That has now been sent out. <laughs> That's wonderful. So, all right. Uh, was Portugal the? No, okay. Was I'm sorry. Portu yes. Yeah, was Portugal the first to Portugal. start slavery? Portugal. Yeah. One of so. the first ships came from Portugal. Um. That's. Uh, thank you so much for the informative talk. I really appreciate your lovely spirit and all the research you've done. Uh, the history you. is heart-wrenching, but you're absolutely right. Acknowledge the history and don't repeat it. Yes, I agree. Thank you. Um, somebody wanted to uh, repeat the info on the other site to come in New Brunswick. Um, I am not that way. I think somebody contributed that information. So, um, Perth Amboy, uh, not Perth. Maybe it was something that I think, believe that somebody else said, but you can, if you want to yeah. repeat the Perth Amboy one, you can do that as well. They called it the lost souls project. I remembered that because I, I like that name. I like that. All right. And by the way, the gentleman standing behind me, I think I think that's one of the uh, freeholders who was a freeholder in uh, 2019, but may not be at this time. Okay. All right, one moment. We have lots of comments of thank you so much. Excellent. <laughs> I'm, I'm so pleased, yeah. Um, let's see, uh, there is an ongoing project in Plainfield about Caesar, a freed slave who served in the Revolutionary War 
as a teamster and did service in Trenton. Um, he is buried in the Scotch Plains Baptist Church, and there is also a project on identifying the names of the enslaved and of the enslaved and freed African Americans. Wow! So there's lots of things going on. It is. It's wonderful. Wonderful. Even with COVID epidemic, virtually history is being shared. You know, history is being made and shared. You know, happy that you're sharing that with me. It looks like so far 21 in that project have been identified, the person said. So, uh, yeah, in the city of Philadelphia, they found an unmarked grave with over 200 bodies in it. Of all ages and all, and it's a project that a a friend of mine, um, Lamont Steptoe, is is working on, and uh, I I'd love to know more information about that. All right, and I somebody sent us the uh, the link for the Lost Souls project, so I included that in the chat as well. Thank so you. Please take a look at that. All right. Um, it looks like that is everything right now. So um, I just like to extend a, a big thanks to you, Sandra, for a fantastic presentation, and thank you to Cindy, who does a great job coordinating these things. Yes, she does. Yes, she does. So. I, I I I loved working with you. I'm so happy that you reached out to me. Uh, regarding this, and it's it's a joy and a pleasure. Uh, Thank you so much, Sandra. You know, I found this because of researching just Black history in New Jersey, and I saw where you had done this type of a talk at Rutgers University in 2018, and that was what initiated my reaching out to you. Uh, I took a little bit of, of research and finding, you know, where you were in that but I'm so thankful that we, that we were able to do that and be able to have this presentation. And you know the back and forth that it took for a little bit, but you know we, we came to one mind and um, I'm so thankful that you were willing to do this and um, that you took your time and some other things and you know we're able to put this on for us. And so thank you for everyone who attended and who's still listening. I know it's gone down a little bit, but we appreciate that you were with us. I wanna thank Andrew again and yes we thank each other maybe every time if you hear us and they go like oh here goes the mutual society again well it's not that it's just that we work as a team and we appreciate each other and so when you do that good things happen well thank you very much it's my pleasure god bless each and every one of you and again smile at an ancestor today <laughs> okay Will do.